Good morning, everybody. Uh, it is 831, and we are going to start with the Administration and Finance Committee. Um, at this time, uh, if uh, Director Salazar would uh, lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Please have a roll call. Jackie Gonzalez. Present. Mary Allen Lewis. Present. Jeremy Coleman. Erica Maney. Here. Aaron Lewis. Here. Okay. Uh, safety briefing. Good morning, everyone. My name is John Esparza, and I'm the Safety and Security Administrator here for the CCRTA. And today, I'll be giving you a short safety briefing. In the event of an emergency, we will exit the boardroom to my right, your left, proceed toward the west stairwell down to the first floor, where you will exit through the west side doors. Once outside, we will continue towards the clock tower adjacent to the transfer station. Marisa will account for all the board members. I will be the last one out to ensure that everyone gets out safely. Three things to remember. Please do not use the elevator during the emergency. Please do not return until the ocular has been given. And if we need to shelter in place, we will do so in the west side stairwell. Thank you all. Thank you. Do we have uh, any uh, conflict of interest affidavits? We do not. OK. And what about any public comment? <clears throat> None. Thank you, ma'am. Then uh, we will move to item number five on our agenda which is the action to approve the Administration and Finance Committee minute, meeting minutes of November the 16th, 2023. I'll make a motion. You made the motion? Yes. Uh, Ms. Mamie uh, made a motion. Do I have a second? A second. Uh, Director uh, Aaron uh, Munoz has a second. Uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? Same sign? Uh, Aye. I, I'm assuming Director Allison voted aye in favor, correct? Yes. Uh, hearing no opposition, uh, the motion passes. Uh, item agenda number six is the action to recommend the Board of Directors adopt a resolution to support low or no emission grant and grant for buses and bus facilities, uh, consolidated fiscal year 2023. Uh, Mr. Patrick? Oh. <laughs> Good morning. Uh, I'm Rita Patrick, the Managing Director of Public Relations. Today we're asking for a resolution to apply for the 5339 B and C low or no admission grant applications. The board priority is transparency. FTA released the opportunity for the grant funding on January 27th. It's $1.7 billion for the fiscal year 2023 to support the state and local efforts. <clears throat> the funds remain available for obligation for fiscal year, four fiscal years. All eligible expenses are um, in compliance with the Clean Air Act and the American Disabilities Act. Federal funds are to cover 85% and both um, applications deadlines is April 13, 2023. Uh, the U.S. is asking to achieve a 50 to 50 percent reduction in the pollution by 2030. They encourage transit agencies to also reduce their emissions and uh, help transit transits with bus fleets that are undergoing dramatic shifts towards alternative fuel. They also want transit agencies uh, to develop an action plan that will help include converting their fleets to electric and uh, buses and their, to make them more efficient. We want to foster economic growth by supporting good paying jobs, help reduce carbon emissions, lead to cleaner air and healthier communities, and a better transportation. Uh, the funds will also help communities that have too often been left behind, and it will help uh, you know, the economic sustainability and equitability for all of us. The, uh, we, the identified needs are electric buses, the supporting infrastructure, and a rural transfer station in Robstown with the park and ride. Funds will be used to enhance our safety, modernize, modernize 
uh, modernize our fleet, support our infrastructure in the transition, and provide and expand transit service to communities that have limited access to transit while providing um, upgrades to our station accessibilities. We anticipate participation with our CD CTE partners uh, to help us with the grant application. Cassidy and Associates to review and edit our application. We'll name a bus manufacturer before we submit the application. And um, engineers will be selected from our current engineering pool. The process is that we apply for the grant with the assistance of CTE, Cassidy Associates, and our RTA staff. Can you go ahead and pass that on? Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, okay. I talk so fast, I knock them off. <laughs> Good to go? Okay. So, uh, as I said, uh, the grant, we prepare it uh, in collaboration with CTE, Cassidy Associates, and our RTA staff. RTA will request letters of support from political and community stakeholders. In addition, RTA is currently working on identifying the most suitable routes for the electric buses and charging stations, and we'll include that information in our grant. <clears throat> so, the financial impact. The 5339C grant will be not to exceed 22 million for 13 electric buses in the supporting infrastructure. The 5339B grant will be a little over 2 million for the Robstown transfer station and its supporting electric infrastructure. And that is a, a, a rendition that we've gotten recently. <coughs> so, <coughs> so we don't want to exceed 22 million for the 13 electric buses and supporting infrastructure. This is a reduction from last year's application. And it's, a, it's less buses as well. Okay, it's 22 million for 13 electric buses and 2 million for the charging station? Yes, so we're gonna do two separate applications. So basically, uh, the staff requests the board of directors adopt a resolution to support low or no admission grant and grant for bus and bus facilities consolidated fiscal year 2023 funding opportunity by authorizing the acting CEO or designatee to exec execute and submit an application for the low or no admission vehicle program 5339C and the bus and bus facilities competitive program 49 USC 5339B. Those are the two separate grants that we'll be applying for. And this gives us the opportunity to move with this resolution, we can move quickly to start the process and um, meet the deadline of April 13th because it's quite quickly coming up on us. Are there any questions or comments? Yes, I have a question. Um, <coughs> so we are responsible for 10% of the 22 million, <coughs> is that correct? Actually, we might be uh, going for a, uh, our consultants are asking us to you know, increase that so amount. Typically, for a bus purchase, it's an 85-15 split, federal government 85, we're 15. Mm -hmm. Sometimes in order to enhance our application, because we would not just be a stack, one in the stack in there, we increase our percentage of 15 to 20 or 25, and that's what we did last time. And that tells the federal government that we have the financial capability to do some of these things here. And, and they, sometimes it gives us a little more favor in the application process. So we might do 20 or 25 somewhere. We have to have some internal conversations about yes. that. Yes. Okay. So what is the timeline? Um, so we request the federal funding, and uh, how, 
many buses do we replace on an annual basis? It really depends on our schedule. Uh, a typical big bus should last us 12 years. That's what the federal government wants it to, and a mid-side bus is about seven years. Um, it always helps our application if we're replacing a bus that's beyond the 12 years. Uh, if someone's replacing a bus at 12 years and someone's at 15 years, they might look at the 15 year a little bit more because they have a greater need and you might be able to maintain that bus level 12. So it really depends on our schedule. We have a master fleet plan that shows, um, you can retire a bus for two different ways. One, years, the 12 years or seven, or miles, 500,000 miles or 250,000 miles. And it's whichever comes first between the 12 years or 500,000 miles, or the seven years and 250,000 miles. And it's really dependent on us um, to decide how we replace that bus and, and how the bus is maintain, being maintained. And what is our typical schedule as far as time? Do we normally hit the miles or the years first? Uh, we have typically did years. Uh, we have been lately doing some miles so that we can try to take advantage of these programs. If we didn't have these programs where they were putting out more money and we're just standardly replacing it with our 5307 money, we typically go by years. But when we want to accelerate a little bit and sometimes we hit the miles and we're going to want to take advantage of a grant, we might be able to do the miles because it, it might happen first. I would add, we haven't had any <coughs> large buses replaced for six years. 2017 was the last time we had any of the large buses come in. And in a perfect world, too, and I'll just talk on my behalf on the finance side, um, we stagger these out. We don't sit there and do big bus purchases and have to put out a lot of money at one time. So we don't sit there and say we replace half the fleet at 12 years and the other half. We kind of stagger them out. So it's better if we do things like that. And so how many years do we have to use up this money? Uh, typically, it's the apportioned year and three more years. And I believe the four. presentation said four years. So that's the three, the four year plus four, three more, so four years. And um, so we have to, the co our cost is going to be 15%. It's, it's for the facility? If we just did the standard program, 8515, yes, ma'am, it would be 15%. Okay. Um, so what's the plan to request? We're having some conversation. We've talked about 20, maybe 25% uh, in order to enhance our, our application. Do you get additional scoring points for increasing the match? Yeah, there's a so. whole slew of things they look at, and then there's things behind the scenes that you look at as well, too, and that's one of those that we can control the, the percentage match in there that hopefully we can get a better look at it oh now he's saying 85 percent but that's for the vehicle so there's some things like the infrastructure that's not a 1585 match we had that the, the some are 80 20 some are 50 50 it could be as low as 50 50 sometimes so it really depends on what you're buying so our plan is to submit the application for these funds and then we're responsible for whatever so is the application, have you all decided on the percentage amount? Uh, because the documents state 10 and 15% as far as our cost. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not quite sure we were 100% decided once, on that. Once we start working through the whole application and we work with the operations and um, capital projects and we determine how much we go through each and CTE and CASTI Associates, their recommendations. So we decide in that, that area plus the finance on what we can afford and what we can sustain. And so we, we determine all of that in the contract. It's a, a large formula. And like uh, Derek said, there might be some where it's 90% is taken, 10%, it could be. Yeah. But we average of probably 15 to, so, to 20. And we might go as high as, like we said, 25%. The one uh, in 2019, we did, uh, when we did that uh, and we were awarded, we did 20, 25%, yes. was it? And we were awarded the uh, our grant that year, so we know that that does play a small factor. They say, not so point wise, but we we have seen them, you know, reward people who give more in there, have more stake in the game. Okay, um, in in our financial budget, mm -hmm. is this already included? Is this already um, this, part this of this? This is not that? included. No, um, let me see. Let me drop, take a step back. We have some in our CIP on, a, on our capital plan. We have some of these buses that we replace. If we do a, a bigger quantity because we're going after these federal dollars, then we might have to come back for a budget amendment. If the grant is awarded at that point in time, we'll do that. Okay, so has the budget been um, reviewed in adding this additional expense? No, but I will tell you, because uh, we have just recently come to the realization of about $22 million and the other $2 million. There has been a lot of conversation back and forth. I will tell you, we were financially prepared to do it when we were going to do the $61 million. So at $22 million, uh, it should be a lot easier, obviously, for us to sustain that when we put the last application in last year. Um, I have a few more questions. Let me, does anybody else have questions on what I'm thinking? Yes. Okay. Go ahead. <laughs> 
This is more of a general question. I think you've answered part of it is, uh, what do we propose to do differently than we did the last time? Because obviously we didn't make it last time. And so I think one of the <laughs> things that you all said was you may want to put more stake in the game by contributing more money, which is, you know, that's, I wanted to hear what other things that you guys or your uh, lobbyists or whoever's yes, going well, to. Yes, we're going to work with, consultants. Our, with our consultants. Yeah, lobbyists is a four-letter word yeah. for us. So yeah. we're working with the consultants. We've already started working with them and talking to them on <laughs> what their suggestions are on the grants. And that's why we decided one of the things was to split the, the, uh, the, the grant. Last year we did it as one, but we're doing it as two this year. So the transfer station and the Robstown infrastructure will be a totally separate one, and then this one as well. So, and we've reduced the amount of buses. We've reduced the amount we're asking for. We're increasing the amount we will contribute. And all of these factors, along with heavy consulting and stakeholder participation, the letters of support, we're, we're going out earlier. All of those things we're hoping will bring us a little closer to the top than last year. So if the application can <coughs> be submitted as two separate, Yes. What if we get approved for the buses first and not the facility? What's the plan for that? That could happen, and we have to uh, move forward on that. The, the infrastructure in the Robstown is a s secondary you know, um, program that we could do you know, later on. We can apply for that if it doesn't go through. But isn't the Robstown facility going to be like a charging station for the buses? It would be a charging station. So how would the buses get char uh, charged if we don't receive the grant? They would be charged here on site. The, the only thing that affects it is that the Route 27 wouldn't be utilized for the electric buses until we had charging equipment placed out there. We have plenty of other routes across the city that we can place electric vehicles on. I mean, if we were asking for 26 or 30 again, oh, by all means, that becomes an issue. But managing uh, 13, we, we've got plenty of service out there that we can use for the electric buses. And so we already have charging stations for these buses? Or well, will that part, be part of the infrastructure is charging at our bus yard, because we'll have to have overnight charging at the at Bear Lane facility. So that'll be part of the, the, the bus um, 5339C. We'll have charging equipment placed in it. The Robstown station will have its own on-route charger, they call it, placed in there. And if we don't get it, then we just won't be able to put electric vehicles on the 27 until we, we get something put out there. So the grant for the buses comes with the charging stations, it, it, the, and it, those would be put here in Corpus. It, it'll it'll have charging stations at our bus yard at Bear Lane buses, and also there's an, uh, we have to incorporate five percent of that is workforce training, and that is part of the requirement. So it also include tools, equipment, training for all of our people from board members on down to our entry level employees. Okay, and um, has the timeline been discussed? Because you know if the grant allows us to. Um, receive these funds with only paying 10% or 15% for the facility. Um, so in order to obtain these grants up front, we're going to take on more cost. Um, has the consultant far firm reviewed like the timeline to say, well, if we wait five years, we, can, we don't have to offer so much cost up front. What, has that been a discussion? The, uh that would be with CTE, the, the transition plan, and, and Derek can speak on well, that. Well, no, I think what she's asking about is about the costing. That goes beyond. CTE is going to help right. us develop a plan and project management and things like that, but she's talking about financials. If we, if we wait and don't ask for the money now, can we get this at a cheaper rate and not have to fork in the extra local match? So that that's a... I think a little bit more of an internal d d discussion, a little bit. Yes, CT will tell us that the prices on some of these things do come down the more they, they get into the market. So I can tell you that vehicles and stuff will get competitive, but I think our fed federal um, consultants would probably say that it's unpredictable who's going to be in office at certain times. Right now, we had, they had this five-year package. We're in year two of it. So at any given moment, you know, if it flips, you know, somebody could try to repeal that funding at some point yeah. in time, then this, it's not there for us. This competitive, these dollars have never been this high ever. Last year was the first time that the, the this amount of money had been input into that uh, program. Yeah, I, I'll say, so prior to last year, they normally gave out about, like, uh, I think it was around 150 to 200 million in that for the, the lower no program, and that jumped, obviously, to you know, 1.7 billion combining facilities in the bus purchases. So this is a 
significantly different than whatever what had been offered in the years past. So what are some advantages us doing this now versus waiting until later besides the cost? Well, adopting the technology is not going to be simple. And I think last year we were a little over aggressive and that was taking a big bite. Now we're asking for a smaller bite. And it, when you, by the time you know, we find out the award and there's some processes that procurement and f finance have to go through to actually appropriate that, those funds. And then we, by the time we issue uh, a PO, it's, you're talking a year and a half for the bus build before it actually gets here. So we're two years out from seeing anything at, at this point pretty easily. So it gives us a chance to, to start preparing. Um, I mean, this is the wave. I mean, it's just like cars as bigger states like California, New York, and things like that start um, saying that they're not going to allow combustion engines on the road. I mean, Cummins and everybody's already you know, looking at the future 10 years from now, and eventually diesel CNG buses won't be an option at a point. So um, it, it, nothing's getting cheaper, really. Even though, yeah, the more they're on the market, some things may get cheaper, but if we continue with inflation like we've had, <laughs> you're not going to see prices drop on on. Any and of this and stuff. You, like you said, the administration will change. The, this money could possibly go away next year. Yeah, and for us in Texas, you know, we're reliant a lot on the federal funds to help cover this stuff. You know, California has other initiatives, so they already started this without the federal money because they have state money coming in to help pay for a, a lot of these things. If we don't get it at some point in time, it'll be all on us using our, you know, our local funds and our other federal funds that we get. So um, today we're um, trying to finalize whether we agree to approve the application, and are we going to are we going to see the numbers before the final approval? Yeah, we're you are going to uh, agree to let us move forward with the application and complete that. We can come back and let you know what the application looks like and all the details if you'd like to see that. Okay. I, I would like to agree to that. Yeah. Yeah, to approve a resolution which will support an application going out. Yes. They are reviewing. We have rough costs. So part of what the FTA wants, and they've actually specifically said, is they want projects that are ready to go quickly. And they, this is them giving away a bypassing some of their procurement policies because they don't want you to wait they, they want the money out on the street. Now, we do have, and John Bell can speak on it more, but we do have a kind of a mini process we have to follow to meet state regulations on, on there. But they actually want you to name as many people, and they've said that in some of our, mm -hmm. our, our meetings because they want this project to move forward, like, right away. They don't want you waiting, coming up with, you know, going through your processes, and then a year later naming a bus company to it, and then... Um, We're, we're, we, ha we haven't named them in part because we're waiting on the, the, the quotes that, that actually come back on what the, the um, things are, the pricing for the manufacturers are. And that was part of the, the trip that Mike and I took last uh, week was to, to visit some of these. And in years past, we've had uh, you know, other board members that visited some of these. But obviously, we want to see the, the price that they're, they're giving us. That way, we can make sure we're getting the best value for it. And we still have to release kind of a mini RFP for two weeks and at the meet state requirements as part of this okay. as well. Now, now FTA did say during the webinar that if something happens to that manufacturer, something goes wrong or something changes, you can go back in and amend that and, and tell them that you have changed that. So that is an option within. Yeah, we, we just want to narrow in kind of the budget wise because some are, there's gaps. So. There, there are protocols, and what they want to look at is that you're not just naming some back, backwards place that's not prepared to actually build the, the bus with the battery electric technology and support it. So, yeah, they, they, and that, that will kind of go into their scoring your technical proposal as well, because if you're naming somebody they don't know with a really crazy price, yeah, I wouldn't, yeah, I wouldn't put any money on getting selected if, if that's your, your I, I choice. That's <laughs>
you, you could essentially name everything. You can name your engineers, charging company, architects, whatever. And that we're not going to do all that, but we are going to try to, to name that way we can narrow in the, the prices on, on some of that. And part of needing this resolution to moving on to the board is so that way we can reach out to our um, uh, political you know, affiliates in the area and AEP and things like that. So we don't want to go forward asking for letters of support until our, our board has you know, given us the, the approval. Um, the only thing, if we could have like a proposal of budget, um, because once we apply, we will get it. So we know what our expenses will be within those four years. Yeah, so we have that $22, $24 million up there between the two budgets out there, between the two grant applications, potential grant applications. And I'm sure we'll break it down and present something a little more okay. line item to y'all. Thank you. No more questions. I had one more. Oh, yeah. Oh, go ahead. A couple things, I may have missed this. What was the percentage you were recommending that we say we're gonna match? I don't think we have decided 100% on that. At least from the finance side, I haven't heard that yet. Okay. We, we've had so some conversations, so we're not in the dark, but we, we're still- Do you have a ballpark idea? I, I believe we've talked about 20 to 25%. million, dollars, a 10% difference is substantial. Yeah. yeah, I believe we're at about 20 to 25% is what we're talking about internally here. So we're looking at an extra $2 million a year. Correct. Well, no, oh. no, this, this is gonna be a one-time when you pay for the buses, it's not going to be on a yearly basis. Anymore, right. So. The contract we were talking about a minute ago, doing it over three to four years, right? Well, you have that long to appropriate. We'll, they'll appropriate the money, then they'll obligate the money, and then you have to have a time to spend it down. So, right. it, and depending on, they usually ship the buses in in series. They're not going to ship all 13 at one time, most likely. So, so we're already looking at budget shortfalls. Where's the $6 million coming from? It'll come out of unrestricted reserves. Do we have enough money to do that? Currently, we're at. Last time we were at $52 million, 30-ish 30, uh, of it, or 20 of it is um, restricted according to what we do with our operating, our benefits, our capital reserves, and then our, our bond payment of $1.6 million we usually have in there. Uh, so we have about 20 million of that reserved for that, and then we have about $32 million of unnamed, untapped, unrestricted reserves. So you're probably more frugal than I am. Uh, yes, sir. <laughs> first question, can no, we afford no, it and is this prudent and a good financial decision? Um, yeah, I, we can afford it. So, um, I, I would interject a little bit more of a conversation as if I think we couldn't afford it in there at this point in time here. I'll tell you what, I could swallow the 22 million a lot more than I could swallow the $61 million. Okay. Now, I, I will say for all, everybody's knowledge, at the full board on the next meeting, we're going to have CTE here to present our final copy of the zero emission transition plan. So it won't say that the order of 13 buses, but they'll, they'll show a goal, say we were to use California's mandate of being zero emission by 2040, it's gonna show the long-term costs of battery electric, hydrogen, mixed fuel cell, and compare that to what our, our current costs for a CNG and diesel fleet is. So you'll see a little bit more detail in that 20, 30 minute presentation um, next week. Thanks. I have one more question, the timeline to submitted and all that? Well, is that April 13th is the, the is the application. Mm -hmm. This one is due. Um, is they'll it? review April 13th okay. is when the application is due. And then they'll review them and they're somewhere around 75 days. They should be able to give us an idea of who's okay. announcement of who, who's been awarded at that point in time. And then the process will start after that. Second. She muted herself there. So. Muted herself. Um, I'm sorry, Allison. I can't hear Gabby. Sorry, her, my, sorry, my mic her, was off. Mic. I got it on, Director yes. Allison. Uh, does, uh, and that was after they reminded me to turn it on. So um, is that an I vote? In favor. I'm in, in favor. favor. Thank you. It just comes across delayed. Yeah. So I didn't, I didn't want to, if it was opposed, I wanted to make sure. Uh, hearing no opposition, uh, the <laughs> motion you. carries. Uh, 
uh, that brings us to a um, item agenda number seven and that is that the board recommend, uh, the board of directors authorize the chief executive officer or his designee to approve a three-year contract for federal legislative consulting services with Cassidy and Associates, and that is Ms. Rita. Okay, so today we are here to ask for a three-year contract with federal legislative consulting services, Cassidy and Associate LLC. Our board priority is transparency. RTA contracts for federal consulting services to assist with our legislative action, FTA request, grant applications, and other congressional related items. Currently, uh, Cassidy and Associates uh, has provided this type of services. As you recall, Cassidy and Associates assisted us with our, uh, our receiving a competitive grant award in 2019. Cassidy and Associates would assist with future competitive grant applications. The consulting services provided by Cassidy has been exceptional. Their leadership would like, to, our leadership would like to continue this partnership going forward. The current contract is scheduled to expire on March 31st, 2023. DBE, while federal funds it will not be used to uh, pay for this, we still encourage all of our partners to uh, reach out to small businesses and disadvantaged businesses to work with them. The financial impact is a three-year contract at 126,000 annually uh, for a total of 378,000 total for the three-year contract with a one two-year option. At this time, staff requests the Administration and Finance Committee to recommend the Board of Directors authorize the acting CEO or designatee to approve a contract for federal legis legislative consulting services to Cassidy and Associates, LLC, for a three-year period, effective April 1, 2023. Any questions? Anybody have any questions? Yes. <laughs> yes, I do. Okay. So... Um, how long has this company been around? They've been around in excess of probably 20 years, I believe. I'll have to go back and check. And how long have we um, used them? For we have used them since 2019, or right before 2019, 2018, when we, we uh, started working with them. And how, it, since we began working with them, how much um, revenue or income or grants have they brought to us the grant that we received for the port air station the parking lot and the uh, new transfer station super stops at Del Mar it was one large competitive grant it was the first competitive grant we ever received and it was through their assistance okay and so the the contracts we have two options it's a three-year contract or a, a three-year three contract option. with a one two-year option to <coughs> proceed that three-year contract. So, so a total five? An, yeah, so you could do an option year as well. And so, th and this is the same company that's going to assist us with this federal grant yes. application, yes. correct? They work with us when we go to legislative conferences. <coughs> uh, when we visit the Hill, they make all of the arrangements for us to meet with our, our um, legislative groups. Um, they speak with the FTA with us. They coordinate all of those, um, those events, those, those meetings. They are extremely helpful. Um, I mean, some of you guys have been there with us and are very familiar with the process that we go through. Right when we go to Washington. Okay, and can you explain the disadvantaged uh, businesses? No. No. Sorry, I, I, go ahead, go ahead. Thank you. Yeah, the disadvantaged um, so it, businesses. It's, it's local funds, so it's really not applicable, but we always encourage our partners to, to do any business with this DBE. So how is that, um, like, so it's encouraged, but, I mean, what, what are some things that they do? Uh, well, we just encourage anyone. We can't make anyone do anything. Right. So we just encourage people to, our partners to work with 
are there any systems in place? Are there any? Do we provide any um, list of like local organizations or, or businesses? Um, well, they're federal, so if there's anything in their area or their community, they're but not really we do have them. partners here that we give the information to. They're not using subcontractors. No, that slide's just there. There's no subcontractors. It's just this company. Oh, I see. Okay, I see what you. I, I get that. Okay. Um, I have no further questions. Lynn. So they've been with us since. No questions. Thank you. <laughs> they've been with us since 2018. What's the record on competitive grants? We have received one. How many have we applied for? Two since I've been here. So just that one and one other? So the what one is we applied for last year and the one we applied for in 2019, that we received in 2019. So yeah. the four years of work, I'm assuming we were paying about 10000 a month? Uh, this is a 5% increase. Okay, so close-ish. Yeah. Um, yeah, so 10000 a month exactly if it's five, or pretty close to it. Uh, so second question then is, are we basically paying 10000 a month for scheduling during events and forwarding FTA emails to us? They, they continue to work with our, our executives and uh, give us information. They, they are constantly talking with our, our organization, or the legislative groups. Just to help her out here, so, so one of the things that they have done is they try to alert us a lot of some of the other grant opportunities that if, may not be just the FTA, so whether it's Department of Energy or FEMA or whatever, one of our limitations has been not having the, somebody that's dedicated to grant writing, and I know that's something that Rita's been put in task with, so that way some of these smaller grants, we just haven't had the resources to, to put our effort towards, and that whether it's I said FEMA stuff, or Department of Homeland Security for safety security initiatives, or it, like I said, there, there's stuff the Department of Energy puts out that we could be applying for for facilities, and, and somewhat affects the bus stuff. So they've been notifying us of additional opportunities. We just haven't been able to put in the extra effort that we need to to, to apply for some of these. So effectively forwarding emails from multiple departments rather than just one. Do we go out for bid on this? I'm sorry, what did you say? Did we request bids from other groups that do this sort of consulting service? We, uh, I don't think we have gone out for bids for this services. This was done strictly with a professional services agreement, so there's no bids process for that, but we're scanning the full horizon and, and asking for proposals or bids. So do we consider potentially other groups that may do grant writing or may offer similar services for a similar price that allows us to go after some of those grants? That's strictly really depending on what the CEO is looking for, and, and he can he or she can talk to staff about that. But uh, um, you know, that, that's that's a I, just so to clarify, I don't necessarily have a, I don't have any problem with this group at all. It just is ten thousand dollars a month to effectively forward some emails, apply for a grant every other year, and not actually help with any of the grants uh, for these smaller ones. Seems like a lot of money. Well, they do more than just grant. And yep, like I said, they, they work with us when we go to the Hill. They're in constant communication with FTA and, and, and various other entities uh, within the D.C. area. Um, they, they provide us information of what's coming up, what's going on. Um, it's, and like I said, they, they've helped us with the previous grant. And then uh, last year we, we applied for that one. And we, we plan on expanding the uh, working with more grants, as he stated. But yeah, I, and I'm just saying, it seems like that's <coughs> a number you could works, go. It, you know, it's, as you know, it's, it's, it's uh, varying from. I will say that for an agency our size, we do a lot of times have to subcontract out somebody and get some other help because we just don't have the, the raw staff like a DART or a Houston Metro or somebody would to dedicate themselves to do a lot of these things in there. Um, the grant process of getting awarded is a myriad of different things that go into it. Uh, and I, we couldn't tell you exactly what percentage of weight that they bring to help award it in here, but we had never been, prior to 2018, 19, we hadn't been awarded a, a, a competitive grant. And if we pay these guys $120,000 or so a year, and we received like we did a, a $9 million grant, you know, there, there's, there's, there's some benefit for that. Now, I couldn't tell you they were 50% of the weight of, of getting it in there, but you know, it was, convenience or, or, or what have you that we happen to get finally get a consultant to help us get through there through the, getting through the red tape of, of DC 
and help us get awarded a grant. So it's just a matter of what direction we're looking for, how to, how to use our best dollars. Is it to pay a consultant to hopefully get a nine, 10, $22 million grant? Or are we thinking that we can get a staff alone to try to do all these things there? And that's tough. It's tough enough to try to do it on a state level, much as a federal level. So and it's just what yeah. we want as an organization. And we previously had um, Larry, what's Larry's Larry name? Myers. Larry Myers for years, and we had not received anything. So we, we did make a switch. I think I got a Christmas card one time. <laughs> so has there ever been discussion to decrease the guaranteed monthly or annual um, contract and award a bonus if we receive funds? I Love that here's, here's just me That's again from the idea. finance side. I, I'm leery of, of giving too many bonuses out with taxpayers' dollars that we do around here. So typically we like to do a contract with them, let them earn that contract. And, and that's just me. Now, I'm just one person out of 300 people. Here. Comment. I mean, and I'm talking about 10 years ago. I don't think I can hear you. This is just a comment, but about 10 years ago, working with similar consulting uh, organizations, the average cost was about 10000 a month. So considering that's what this contract is, I don't see it. I mean, it may sound a lot, but for the, the scale of this organization, I think that's actually a really good price. And unfortunately, that's just the way this kind of business goes where you hire somebody like this to do the every day. You're not gonna get everything, but it looks like they're batting 500 right now, one for two. I mean, that's just my personal opinion. I know I'm not on this committee, but I'm just. Because <clears throat> I have dealt with these type of deals in the past, and. The cost isn't actually that much more than what you're. But these are good questions to ask. We always have to have some discussion around here to make sure we're doing right. I, I, I think the point here might be to consider, and it might be too late on this one, but to make sure we consider having options for the board and say this is still who we're recommending. Obviously, they're the top uh, contender, and 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 have options for the board to say because I know that it's not required in the bid process. It's, as uh, Mr. Wilbright, Director Wilbright said, but it is professional services, and we can uh, have other proposals under professional services, and then you qualify them, and then you categorize where they score, like you've done in other other professional service contracts. Uh, I think the architectural was one that I thought y'all did an excellent job in moving <coughs> forward in the way you do business, and it allowed other firms to actually be considered, because otherwise, these people will never have anybody to challenge them because we got a three-year contract with a two-year option, so we're stuck with them for five years, whether we like it or not, or at least three years. Yes, so sir. It just, uh, and I, you know, not to say that they're not doing a good job. I think the fact that they got that money is very critical. Well, we always love to have a long-term partnership with people for stability in here, but we always want to also look at the market and test the market from time to time, too, yeah. to make sure that we are getting value for our dollar. When it also um, builds... Um, you know, competition for that contractor to, hey, you know, you want to keep that business, you've got to show some results as well. I just, uh, I, obviously I can't vote on this committee, uh, but my suggestion would be, if they are listening to this audio recording at some point, uh, to consider helping out with some of these small energy contracts and other things, because the amount of time that would take them is insignificant. And for doing work every two years other than scheduling and forwarding emails, uh, that's a pretty reasonable ask. And I do know that we're not bound technically by any contract because budgets can change by a board of director at any yeah. time. So I think it'd be worthwhile for them to uh, consider offering some of those small services to increase the value. I'm assuming there's an out clause. Let's say that we're not satisfied with them, a provision in the contract or not. We typically have out clauses in there. And as Dr. Wubite sat there and said, from year to year, if our budget changes, uh, we, we can do cuts from here and there and void contracts. I, I typically say, let's do our homework in here. I don't just void contracts because then we get a bad reputation out there, but we wanna make sure that we are carefully looking at all our contracts before we enter into them. And I know you um, mentioned hiring somebody, um, a staff, mm -hmm. to you know, do solely this. Has that been looked into? Well, Rita can talk to you. It's gonna be her position there. So. Well, are you referring to the, she's not referring to grant writing, are you? Yeah, the con yeah the, what, what all the work that the consulting um, She's well, talked, she said hiring the staff, so I'm assuming it's a grant writer. Yeah, well, not a the grant writing, yes, we, we will be hiring a grant writer <coughs> that will help us with the actual writing of the grant and the documentation <coughs> versus somebody That's who is a consultant who is working on, on the Hill 
with the uh, stakeholders because even though you put in an application for a competitive grant, there's a lot of other percentages of factors that go into it. Once you're you know, at the top, then they select those and they look at your stakeholders, they look at your, your representatives, are they supporting you? Are the, the senators supporting you? Are these people supporting you? And these people help us move that needle. That's the area that they're working in the consulting area. Still two years ago when we had this grant application, I know there was a lot of frustration over most agencies our size, if I remember correctly, got grants. Because we sat here saying, how the heck do we not get this grant or not get any of it? And so, I mean, that was a pretty large miss, in my opinion, back two years ago. Because that was when COVID funding was happening and they were trying to pour money everywhere they could across the entire thing. So missing that was significant, especially missing it 100%. I just wanted to let y'all know we'll be opening up that position later on this week. So it'll be going up live. And that's why I had the questions that I had for the same reason. Th those are, again, those are always good questions. We, we expect that those, the questions we can answer in here or workshops or wherever we have in there, but it's never bad to ask a question. So that's good, appreciate it. Hearing no objection, it's probably because my mic was once again off. Uh, hearing no objection, uh, the motion yes, passes. Lynn, I'm sorry, I forget to turn it off and on. <laughs> That's okay. Here, I remembered this time we're going to go to item agenda number eight, uh, and that is to recommend the board of directors authorize the chief executive officer or his designee to approve a three year contract for state legislative consulting services with Longbow Partners LLP. Um, is there any discussion on that? Uh, well, Ms. Patrick, obviously. Okay, so this uh, board priority is uh, for transparency. So RTA contracts for state consulting services to assist with legislative initiatives are the process and ident identifying discretionary funding opportunities. Currently, we contract with Longbow Partner Partners LLP to do these uh, services for us. Longbow Partners are currently working to help us on uh, some amending legislation um, and to create transportation laws that would benefit RTA. The services provided by Longbow have been excellent and management would recommend we continue with these services as well. The current contract is scheduled to expire on June 5th, 2023. However, we would like to begin a new agreement with them that would replace the current contract. The new agreement would align with the federal contract so you guys would see both the state and the federal on the same timeline. Again, the DBE is not federally funded, but like I said, we always encourage partners to, to do business with any small business as they can. That's what we do. <laughs> That's a new department that, that is mine is DBE, so I wanna make sure we, we take care of that. So financial impact for the state consulting services is a three-year contract at $75,000 annually. The total would be $225,000 total for the three-year contract with the one two-year option that uh, would be presented to their board for approval. At this time, the staff requests the Administration and Finance Committee to recommend the board of director authorize the acting CEO or designatee to approve a contract for State Legislative Consulting Services to Longbow Partners, LLP, for a three-year period, effective April 1st, 2023. Do you have any questions? Looks like Director may be I know. Sorry, hold on. Looks like Director like maybe really has a question. I reading all of this. So I had a lot of questions. I'm just going to leave my mic on. How 
long have we um, how long have we been um, using this company? We've been using this company for many years. Trist has been with us, and I don't have this specific timeline because I've only been here uh, four and a half years. But you know, Robert, maybe you know how many years we've had the contract in excess of ten. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, same questions as before. Has have we reached out to any other companies? for bids or, you know, We rates. have not at this time. And are we creating an increase? There um, is, are they asking for an there increase? There is in a small increase with his How contract. much is that? And it is, I believe, let's see. So his contract was a little different. It was in session versus out of session. And so we just rounded it up, and I believe it is about a 5% increase as well. Can get you and so besides um, working with the legislation and up in Austin, um, what additional benefits does this company provide to the RTA? They, they too work with uh, consulting us on grants, anything that's going on within the state during session years and non-session. Both of these organizations provide us with weekly, bi-weekly, or monthly you know, information that's going on that is pertinent to uh, transit as well as, you know, other things. Um, they take us uh, to the, uh, uh, the state capitol. They help us meet with our, our leadership. They, they're just all around consulting with, for us on behalf of us. They're our spokesperson in the state that helps us represent us when we're not there. Okay, and as far as the, um, you said that they assist us with grant writing on a state level, they assist us with various information. Yes. So and if, how if many I may grants? Add to, if I may add to Rita's, uh, I've been working with Trist uh, and his company working on our legislative agenda this time. So when we're going to try to get a bill submitted, for example, the fares and things like that, they help us with the language. They help us with the bill writers. They also help us talk to the legislators. Who's going to put the bill in? And then they help us get the lobbying done to hopefully pass our bill. Consulting. So they, yeah, they work with literally every step of the way. It's not, it's not just a yeah. like, oh, it's consulting. It's hand holding to some degree because they help us in every step. Okay. And just to piggyback off the Director Canales's comment, they also keep us aware of uh, other issues that may be, they may come up in the legislature that maybe we don't have the capacity to like monitor all of these things at once. So things that may affect transit, may affect funding for us, may affect air quality. They keep us apprised of all those issues that may come up so that we can quickly develop a strategy if we need to take a defensive measure or if we need to contact this legislator or this person, you know, to discuss, you know, whatever issue may be. So they also help us not only proactively with our legislation, like accomplish the goals we want, but they're also there to be our eyes and ears during sessions so that we're apprised of any issues that may arise that could affect, you know, what we do here as an organization. And they're all very important. Um, you know, parts of the process of what we do. Um, do they assist with grant writing? Oh, I was um, asking that question. Uh, they, on the state they give level? Us, they give us information. They help us edit and, and, and review. We do the, the, the actual documentation, and we go to them and ask them to review it. Do they have any suggestions based on their knowledge of what is needed? Comment, um, I'm, hopefully I'm not talking over anyone. This is Lynn. I also ex have this experience with Longbow that they send updates year round regardless of being in session. And I've noticed just keen relationships that they've cultivated with not only many members of the legislation, but particularly members on the transportation committee, both on the House and Senate side. I just think that's really critical to our initiatives, particularly for this session when we have an aggressive legislative agenda that they've been in front of now before session started. So that's something I wanted to contribute. Thank you. So it sounds like everybody's pleased with this company, the services that this Very company has so. been providing. Yeah. Very much. Yeah, a couple quick questions. What are we currently paying them? We are paying them 68,000 
for three years, or uh, 68,000 a year. So you said out. it was different during session versus we out did of have it. It was sixty six per set uh, out of session and seventy two during session, and so you round it out. It's about sixty eight thousand. So instead of doing it that way <coughs> to make it easy, we just did it across the board. It, it comes out the same. Okay. We have a director of government affairs position, correct? Director of uh, managing director of government affairs. Don't we have that position, or didn't we before? Mike. Mike's old position. Yes, he's yeah, he still works that area. Okay, what is that position salary? Are you able to say that? Is that I don't I don't have his. I would have to get that for you. Okay, it just looks like a very large amount of money that goes into uh, effectively consulting services between those three. Uh, have there been any state grants? Am I just drawing a blank in my head? I'm not aware of any right now that since I've been here. But yeah, they, look, was, they they do a lot more work with us with uh, um, with our legislative. Um, I know that they are working right now with the um, uh, fairs. That they're they're looking to rewrite some of the the language in one of the it, which mem which one is it, um, Sharon? Wh which uh, law is it that they're looking to rewrite for the fairs? Yeah, 451. They're looking to, to yeah. Uh, and I think that's actually been yeah. written already. In yeah, they're working on that. Okay. Uh, so my main question really uh, is we just talked about the last one, how we wish, and multiple directors said this. We wish we had options. We knew what was out there, and we've been with this company a long time. And I'm not saying they're not doing a good job. I actually have had nothing but good things to hear about them. I just question why we want to move up a contract and not get other bids when we're already fully committed and they're fully committed through this session. And this would give us the opportunity to see results through the session and still make the same contract or same renew it. I just don't see any incentive for the RTA to increase or move up a contract period when we're in the middle of a performance time where they are supposed to be producing. And I certainly don't see the reason for moving the contract up without getting other bids or any other considerations for what else is out there for something this size that just don't see why that's, I don't see the incentive on our side where it makes sense to do that. But I can't vote on this one, just no comments. If y'all have a reason for the incentive on our side, I'm all ears. Well, to move the both of them up so you guys can evaluate them both, um, it's just a matter of, uh, I, th I think it's like six weeks, is it, or six, six or eight weeks? Are you talking about that time frame? Uh, yeah, I mean, it's moving up to From June do this in a week. So we'd be making a new contract decision in March, yeah. March 1st, versus making a new contract decision in May or June, May. Uh, or potentially even longer, because the session will lo most likely be over by then. So we're looking at a couple months. I just don't see the, I don't see the advantage for us, other than maybe slightly easier for the board, but I really don't see that as a I, I benefit. Think Part of it was because we've got um, uh, we got recommended by st our state representative that we should be visiting twice a month now, whereas we, we were not going there. So with the increased activity we're expecting to have with this legislative session, I think that was part of the request of making the modification to the contract and extending it because we're planning on uh, visiting with the representatives there quite, quite a bit more than we had in the past. Yeah, I, I believe Representative Hunter was recommending two to four times a month. So this, is a, this isn't just purely for the board scheduling convenience. This is the consultant saying, if you want this level of service, you have to give us another three years. It, it, no. It's a combination. No, no. We're, well, we're trying to line it up with yeah. the, when it, they're going in session in the future and lining it up with all the, the board stuff. But there is kind of a combination. We're, we're expecting to have increased activity, and we're expecting them to do more for us uh, as well. They did, they did not ask for it. Okay. We were just trying to make it so the line. increased activity does not have anything to do with this. But, I mean, on on our part, to... take into account trying to align everything because we going forward we want to do more and we expect more. I would just request when we go to the board we have that answer because I'm hearing two completely different answers there on whether or not that increased activity is a factor or not because I just don't see the incentive on our side and if there's increased activity they, that makes sense. But they, they didn't ask for it. We're we're yes. we're asking to, yes. to to have more participation and do more. So that gets back to why move up the contract. I just don't see the reason. But we can talk about that at the board meeting. Again, I can't vote here.
Thank you. Are there any other comments or questions? Okay. Yeah. Uh, hearing no others, do I have a motion uh, to recommend that the Board of Directors authorize the Chief Executive Officer for his designee to approve a no to approve a three-year contract for state legislative consulting services with Longboat Partners and Associates? Director Allison. So moved, Mr. Chair. So moved. Director Allison uh, makes a motion. Uh, is second. there a second? I'll second. Director Mamie seconds. Uh, all those in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed, same sign. Aye. Uh, Director Allison uh, was an aye, so with hearing no objection, uh, the vote passes. Um, that brings us to agenda number nine, and that is to recommend to the Board of Directors authorize the Chief Executive Officer or his designee and uh, and the CCRTA Legal Counsel, Mr. Bell, to execute the Federal Transit Administration's fiscal year 2023 certifications and assurances. Uh, and that is uh, Mr. Saldana. Oh, good morning, Robert Saldana, Managing Director of Administration. I didn't think I was going to have to stand up till now, but uh, okay. All right, so this lines up with the board priority of public image and transparency. So for about the last 28 years or so now, the FTA has consolidated all our shirts and assurances into one single document. And this will vary from, like the last two years, 21 different items in here to 23 in here. But the shirts and assurances um, are, in, are in place to make sure that the recipient, us, the RTA, complies with federal regulations, particularly with FTA funding. In order to receive FTA funding, all this loan that we just finished talking about, um, bus purchases, everything in here, in order to get our federal funding in here, we must submit our shirts and assurances uh, to the FTA. Now, by doing so, we are telling the FTA that we have the institutional, the managerial, and the financial capability to execute these agreements. Um, we have proper planning, we have proper management in order to make sure these projects get done on, on a timely basis. Last year, as well as this year, uh, there are 21 different categories that we must comply with. Now, not all categories apply to us. There's rail safety that doesn't apply to us. We don't have any rail. There's a tribal transit that we don't have that don't comply with those fixed guideways that aren't part of ours. Uh, but those that do apply to us, we need to make sure that we are, are, are compliant with them here. As I said, before the FTA awards any federal grants, uh, we must submit and the CEO as well as our attorney uh, needs to sign that. And that's our 5307 money that we use to support our preventive maintenance, our most of our CIP capital projects, our 5339, our bus and bus facilities where we buy buses and some uh, facility projects in there, as well as 5310 money, which is the pass-through basically we get for a lot of rural smaller agencies. There is no DBE goal here for this, and there's not a direct financial impact in there, but the financial impact is that if we don't sign and document the search and assurances to the FTA, we're not giving and tearing them that we have the financial means and the managerial means to do it, so we won't get any award of any grants. And this year, we're talking about close to $9 million of, of federal grants about 7.8 of 5307 money, a little over 600,000 of 5339, and a little over 400,000 of the 5310, so about $9 million of grants, as well as a low no potentially 22 million and the other $2 million. So at this time, staff recommends the board of directors authorize the acting chief executive officer, Diggs and Knee, and the CCRTA's legal counsel, Mr. John Bell, to execute the federal Transit Administration's fiscal year 2023 certifications and assurances. I'll take whatever questions you may have. Any questions or comments? Come on, one at least. Left my mic on, yay. <laughs> um, okay, hearing no questions or comments, uh, do I have a motion to recommend to the Board of Directors authorize the Chief Executive Officer or his designee and the CCRTA Legal Counsel, Mr. John Bell, to execute the Federal Transit Administration's fiscal year 2023 certifications and assurances. Is there a motion? Uh, Director Mamie makes a motion. Is there a second? Second. Second. And Director Munoz seconds. Uh, all those in favor say aye. 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 I think I heard Lynn. Aye. <laughs> all those opposed, same sign. Hearing none, uh, the motion passes. Thank you. And now we have uh, 
legis uh, le uh, agenda number 10, and that is to recommend to the Board of Directors authorize the Chief Executive Officer or designee to approve a three-year agreement for employment services with Wood, Poikin, and Walters. Uh, Ms. Gaitan. Good morning. I'm Angelina Gaitan, the Director of Human Resources. This uh, lines up with the board priority of transparency. Our current contract is with Wood, Boykin, and Walters from April the 1st of 2022 to March 31st, 2023, not to exceed $50,000 annually, and attorney hourly rates are 350. Uh, our identifying our need, the RTA utilizes the legal team to provide advice on legal matters that arise from employment matters and to ensure compliance matters are met as related to state and federal laws and regulations. Our financial impact is, is the estimated cost of the agreement for three years is 150,000, 50,000 annually, and it is 100% budgeted in the 2023 operating budget. This does not have a DBE goal because it's not funded with federal dollars. The staff requests the admin and committee to recommend the Board of Directors authorize the acting chief executive or designee to approve the three-year agreement with Wood, Boykin, and Walters for employment legal services. I'll be happy to answer any questions. Are there any questions or comments? I do. Um, similar questions. Um, how long have we used them? With Wood, Boykin, and Walters, it's been well over 13 years. It's been a, an annual agreement that we've had, and right now we want to bring it into a three-year agreement rather than coming out every year. <coughs> and are they local? Yes. It's actually the firm that John Bell works with, but okay. this is the employment law section. Okay. No further questions. Anybody have any other questions or concerns? Uh, hearing none, then I would make, uh, I would entertain a motion uh, or is there a motion uh, to recommend that the board of director authorize the chief executive officer or designee to approve a three-year agreement for employment legal services with Boykin, Boykin and Walters? So moved. Uh, director Mamie makes a motion. Uh, second. Sorry. Director Allison, Allison. seconds. Uh, all those in favor say aye. 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 All, those, aye. all those opposed, same sign. Hearing none, the motion passes. Thank you. Um, I'm going to skip agenda item number 11 uh, as I have a jury in the box in Nueces County, Texas. Are there any other comments or questions from my committee meeting? Uh, hearing none, I would adjourn the meeting at, hold on, wait for it, 940, and I will pass the gavel over to Director Salazar. Here. Here. Item two, safety briefing. Um, Mr. Esparza. Good morning, everyone. My name is John Esparza. I'm the safety and security administrator here for the CCRTA, and today we're giving you a short safety briefing. In the event of an emergency, we will exit the boardroom to my right, your left, proceed toward the west stairwell down to the first floor, and we will exit through the west side doors. Once outside, we will continue to the clock tower adjacent to the transfer station. Marisa will account for all the board members. I will be the last one out to ensure everyone gets out safely. Three things to remember during the emergency. Please do not use the elevator. Please do not return until the all clear has been given. And if we need to shelter in place, we will do so in the west side stairwell. Thank you all. Uh, do we have any, uh, we have a receipt of conflict of interest affidavit? Okay. And item four, opportunity for public comment. Did we have anybody sign up? Yeah, I have a question. Okay. So 
item five discussion and possible action to approve the operations and capital projects committee meeting minutes of november 16 2022 there was no december or january meeting we have a motion by director Wobai. do we have a second a second second by oh chatter <laughs> thank you uh, any other discussion on this item all those in favor say aye aye aye, aye. Those opposed? Motion carries. Item six, discussion and possible action to exercise option year two and increase the contract price with Enterprise Holdings DBA commute with Enterprise for van pool services. All right, good morning again, everyone. The board priority for this is public image and transparency. And I would like to say that we have Mario from Enterprise here. He oversees all of their um, the group leases and that basically from New Braunfels on through South Texas. So some background for the Vanpool program. It's a group of people sharing travel for commuting between a pickup location to a similar destination or work center. It helps promote reduced traffic congestion, improve air quality, and provide savings in fuel and operating costs. Vanpool participants lease the vehicles directly from Commute with Enterprise and then CCRTA pays a monthly subsidy directly to the contractor which is currently based off of van size and the uh, mileage that they use. So our program right now has 31 vans. The Border Patrol is the largest of our participants with seven going to Falfurious, four to Freer, and six to Kingsville. We also have eight uh, to Federal Correction Institute at Three Rivers, four to NAS Kingsville, and over the last few months we've added two to the Chevron in Ingleside. And what's not shown is that we also, this last year, had some seasonal van participants in Port Aransas and the, the island for um, what, what the, the companies that basically services the hotels and the, the rentals. Here you can see our, our annual van pool ridership trends since uh, Enterprise became managed, our, started managing our van pool program. So in 2019, we had uh, almost 54,000, and that was when we had Bechtel, so as we went into 2020, obviously we had the pandemic that started, but also Bechtel closed down their construction operations and moved into full operation. And you can see that the increase from 2021 to 2022. So the initial contract was awarded on April 1st of 2019 as a three-year base contract with two one-year options. And there were no rate increases throughout that contract, um, nothing built into it, and there have been no requests since then. Our current option year, which is the first one, began in April 1st of 2022 and expires March 31st of this year. To continue the program, we will need to exercise option year two and uh, increase the contract price effective April 1st through, and then through March 31st of next year. Basically, in January, Commute with Enterprises uh, sent a request to us to increase the monthly lease rate since they haven't done so for a few years. And, we have a um, part of our requirements is that the vans can't have more than 100,000 miles. So now we've also got the point where these other vans are needing to be replaced, new ones purchased. Um, so the current subsidies and uh, rates were reviewed by us uh, with other agencies because while we haven't reviewed that, haven't had a price increase, we also hadn't looked at our subsidies that we've been providing for several years. We, we negotiated with Commute with Enterprise to help minimize the increase. So their original request was about 35% overall, which includes the maintenance of the vehicle and things like that. So we, we did get them to come down to 20% increase on the monthly lease rates. This is a very complicated um, setup and we'll look at it on our next contract, we'll look to simplify this, but this is basically the, the lease rate and it varies by van size and also how many uh, monthly miles you, you, you're allotted. So. Um, most of the other agencies we looked at have gone to a simpler model, and we'll, we'll do so in the next contract, but for now, we're, we're working off of the, the base contract that we had. Here, this is showing what we're proposing for ourselves and then comparison to the other agencies. So we're proposing to move to a flat rate subsidy, and I'll explain where we're at more on the next slide, and that, so which would be vary between $450 and $500. VIA was currently at 240 which is pretty close to where we were, but they're also in their contract month. It expires at the end of the month, so they're renegotiating theirs as we speak. Denton and Fort Worth uh, both have 505 to 595, which varies by van size. And then Capital Metro is at 450 to $500. And then DART temporarily suspended their van pool 
pro program, and Houston runs it in-house, so there's no subsidy, in, in a sense, for it. So currently, the top table shows how we're subsidizing it, and that by van size and by miles, most of our customers are in that 78 passenger van re, um, size, and they're in that 35 to 45 miles, so that most of them are receiving 300 to $350 for the subsidy. We're proposing to move it to 450 for the 78 passenger van, 475 to the 9 to 10, and $500 for the 11 to 15 passenger van. This is to, to kind of keep up with the other agencies, because there's competitive. There's a couple of VIA vans that are, are running around here in Corpus Christi, so obviously there's people that either live here or work here and, and are living in, in their area. But also to try to minimize the, what we could anyways, the, um, the, the effects of the cost increase on the, the customer in there. So, and then we'll review that again as we proceed into the next contract. So we're paying $350 per van for each trip if they're going over 45 miles, is that correct? For the month, we, we, that's the subsidy that we, we pay depending on how many miles they have. Now when you look at like our quarterly reports, you'll see that currently per passenger, this is actually the most cost effective mode of transportation we have compared to even our fixed route service. So I don't trust you know the numbers better than I do. <laughs> now it may impact this is our fixed route system comes back, you know, that there's ridership restored that may change in the future, but yeah. Due to the monthly lease rates and subsidy increases, a contract modification is required for the option year two, which is a, will be effective April 1st, 2023, through March 31st of 2024. D, no DB for financial impact. The, the budget for the van pool program for 2023 is 122708 under the revised subsidies and saying we're, we're stay at 31 vans, the estimated monthly increase is about $3,725. And that and basically goes from 10,400 to 14,125. And that for the, the rest of 2023, the increase is expected to be $35,617. And this is under the O3 purchase transportation um, item where um, MV and some of the other services are allocated. But the projected growth that we had for this year and then ne next year, the estimated total cost of option year two is $187,050. There you can see the, the cost for 2023 and then the cost for 2024 for the first few months is expected to be 43725 net. So, and that's with the increase, we're expecting the increase of van pools to 35. Maybe we'll do even better for the, the end of the year. And, and, that, and then a small increase in 2024. So with that staff request, the Operations and Capital Projects Committee recommend the Board of Directors authorize the Acting Chief Executive Officer or designee to exercise option year two and increase in contract price with Enterprise Holdings, DBA, commute with Enterprise for Vanpool services. And I'll take any questions you have. Any questions from the committee or any of the board members? If not, I'll entertain a motion to recommend the Board of Directors authorize the Chief executive officer or designee to exercise option year two and increase the contract price with enterprise holdings DBA commute with enterprises for van pool services. Do you have a motion? So moved. So motion by Ms. Jimenez. We have a second? Second. Second by Mr. Woolbright. Any other discussion on this item? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. I really have no other items of the committee chair report other than I guess there's going to be a lot of traveling uh, because we're in session at the state level and I encourage our legislative chair that has been gracious enough to serve at that capacity to support the uh, staff in, in attending it and also encourage the committee members. That's all I have. And it is nine, let's see where's my light. Nine fifty one, and the meeting is adjourned. <laughs> I had so much to, to cover. <laughs>